All right, welcome to Oncology Data Advisor. Today we're here live at the ASCO annual meeting in Chicago, and I'm joined by one of our editorial board members, Dr. Jason Mwabi. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. It's really exciting, especially after doing you know a lot of Zoom interviews over the last couple of years. It's awesome to be able to do an in-person one. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Um, to start off, I'd like to introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you do. Sure. Uh, I'm Jason Mwabi. I'm a breast medical oncologist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. I am currently an assistant professor. I mainly focus on uh, lobular breast cancer carcinoma. It's a very important subtype of breast cancer that's been understudied and uh, we're trying to make a difference by studying it at multiple different levels, the genomic, transcriptomic, and tumor microenvironments levels to try to find novel therapeutics to make this type of cancer history. Amazing. Um, and you uh, presented a poster here this morning um, on the multiomic tumor microenvironment landscape of invasive lobular carcinoma of the breast. Yes. Um, so for a little bit of background of the, uh, for this, what is the role of the tumor microenvironment in invasive lobular carcinoma progression and therapeutic response? This is an excellent question. Uh, for the longest time, the mission of oncology has been going toward what we call precision oncology. And precision oncology, there is no one definition for that. For the longest, the way it was, it's been done is you take a cancer cell, you profile its DNA, you try to unmask mutations and target those mutations. But the problem with that definition of precision oncology is that you're thinking about cancer in isolation. It's like the cancer belongs by itself and there is nothing around it, which never sits well with me since I was a fellow. Uh -huh. I always felt, no, I mean, the answer is not only inside the cancer cell. Well, how is the environment interacting with the cancer? How is the cancer interacting with the environment? I mean, our body has something very powerful called the immune system. We cannot forget about it. How, what is the immune system doing? Is it able to identify it? Is it able to be in the vicinity of it? Why is it not attacking? If it's not there, why is it not there? What's happening? What is the cancer doing to evade the immune system? So these questions were very important for me. And for the longest time, again, and until now, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. We just look at the cancer cell in isolation. We try to look inside the cell, what's wrong with you? and try to formulate our therapeutic like this. But also for our therapeutic to work, they need to get to the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. To get to the cancer cell, they have to pass by the environment. Right. So from that, we really, I went on a quest to unmask the, the intricacies inside the tumor microenvironment of low breast cancer. Maybe by that, I can find the key mm -hmm. to make a big dent in that special subtype of breast cancer. And it took us multiple ways because there is no, not one way of doing it. The, the, the one of the most accessible way and most affordable way of doing it is basically what you do is you take the whole tumor area, digest those cells, extract the RNA, profile the RNA, that's what we call RNA sequencing, and based on models we have right now that are AI-based, they can regenerate the microenvironment. Mm -hmm. So from the RNA sequencing, because those cells are very small, if you're going to put microscope to look at them, it costs so much money because you need to do a special type of staining and stuff like that. It's much easier to digest everything and then reconstitute it using an AI system. So we did that, and it did, it did show very interesting findings that we, we were not expecting. The two major things that we found at that time is that, number one, a big proportion, about 50% of invasive lobular carcinoma are actually immune enriched, meaning the immune system is able to identify the cancer, yet it's not attacking. We found another subtype that's also represent about 30%, so together with the immune enriched, about the majority of lobular cancer, that are highly vascularized, meaning they depend on the formation of new blood vessels for growth. The way I like to, to say it is that if you're in an area in the middle of nowhere and you want to build a house, you have to build a road first, mm -hmm. right? So this cancer is dependent on that, dependent on building roads so they can get the goods so they can grow on both edges of the road. Right. So, Meaning, this type of cancer, if you provide, if you take off the ability of them to produce blood vessels, they cannot grow. So, we did show that, however, because it was something very novel, it was very hard to convince people to buy in because of the way we did it. We, we took the sample, destroyed it, extracted the RNA, and tried to reconstitute it. They were like, maybe the reconstruction is not that good. So, because of that, <clears throat> I tried, you know, to, to get grants for it. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't lucky. So my best resource was my own patients. They donated money for me to be able to do that research. And those type of research costs a lot of money. That's why it's much cheaper to do it the other way around. And this type of research basically, you're taking the sample itself, 
you are you were doing a technology called the MXIF, meaning it's multiplex immunofluorescence. These are antibodies that have a color on them, a fluorescence on them. Where they bind, they cleave the fluorescence and it lights up. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you see, for example, the yellow color, you know that cell is that is that type. If you see a green, depending on which antibody is targeting which type of cell. So then you can really visualize on the sample where the immune cells are and what cells are and where the cancer is and what the... So because seeing is believing uh -huh. nowadays, so I wanted them to see it. Yes. And that's why we did this, tec this technique and we, we did MXIF on more than 2 million cells. Wow. Very expensive to say the least. Yes. But it proved that what we showed before is true. And because of that, those are actionable findings. And because of that, now I'm very excited that I'm getting more and more buy-in mm -hmm. from companies that contain, that has all the drugs that can work in such environments. That hopefully right now we can finally construct and conduct those studies that I truly, truly, deeply believe they're going to change the outcomes of those patients. Absolutely. That's really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are the limitations of traditional histo histopathological methods in dissecting the complexity and heterogeneity of the, of the tumor microenvironment? And how is this new technique um, working around that? Yeah, no, th th this is an amazing question. So uh, immunohistochemistry can't tell me whether I have tumor cell or whether I have immune cell. It really cannot tell me much whether or not what type of immune cells I have. And it doesn't tell me much about like even the cancer itself, about how it's interacting with this environment. The technology that, uh, and, and before I say that, the immune system is not all against cancer. Mm -hmm. Our immune system is very complex. The reason it's complex is because our immune system is so powerful. If we don't keep checks and balances with our immune system, it will destroy the body, mm -hmm. the host. It will destroy us. Our own immune system is so powerful, it can destroy us. And I always tell my patients that just think about a cold or the flu. It's not the virus that's making you sick. It's your immune system fighting that virus. That's why patients who don't have a strong immune system when they have a viral infection, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just when you have a very strong immune system, you have an overwhelming response. When you cannot regulate the response of the immune system to a stimulus, that's when stuff happens. So what regulates the immune system? These are special type of immune cells. Mm -hmm. Cancer can use those type of immune cells to damper the response of the immune system against the cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's really important what's the type of immune cells. So for the longest time on immunohistochemistry, they used to say the word TILS, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. And when you hear that word, and they report it as a number or percentage, you think that all lymphocytes are homogeneous. All of them are doing the same, fighting the cancer, which is not true. They're very heterogeneous. There is so many different types. Some of them fight the cancer, some of them protect the cancer. So this technology can let me know what type I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. What are they? Are they the ones that are protecting the cancer? Are they the ones that are fighting the cancer? What are they? So it really opens a huge door, a big door to, to really find exactly what's happening. And I can tell you that what we found in lobular is that in the immune enriched, there's two types, which make it more complex because initially we thought immune enriched meaning the immune system is there, we can just activate it, attacks, act, and then we found that there's two types. There's one type that is immune enriched, where the type of cells that are available there are cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. These are the cells that cause and kill. So when you have an infection, these are the, the first responders. They go and kill whatever infection you have. If you have cancer cells or precancer cells, they go and kill that. So these are the workers, the soldiers, mm -hmm. and these are excellent. They fight the cancer, so those are available. And what's also available are uh, what we call macrophages, which also come multiple flavors, but the ones that are available are what we call the M1 macrophages that are the pro-inflammatory, and those also help in the fight against cancer. We found a very interesting subtype of immune enriched where the immune cells are there, but there is another type of immune cell called the fibroblast that build a wall mm -hmm. between the cancer and the immune system. Mm -hmm. Meaning the immune system is there, but it cannot access the cancer because there is this huge fibrous tissue, scar tissue between the cancer. So it builds a big wall between the cancer and the immune cells. They cannot access one another. Our immune system is fantastic, but it kills by touching. Mm -hmm. If it cannot touch, it cannot kill. Now some cells do develop antibodies that can target from afar, but at the end of the day, even when you tag something with antibody, the immune system has to come, the antibody flags it, comes and 
phagocytosis, eat it. Right. If okay. there is a wall, they cannot access. Mm -hmm. So although there is another subtype that's immune enriched, is building that wall. Unless we can take down that wall, we cannot. Uh, and all of those, we could not have find them right. with the regular looking uh, the regular immune histochemistry. Amazing. Um, so would you like to tell us more about um, this new approach um, and what you are investigating in the study? Yes. Yeah, so, so this one is to uh, proof of concept. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is something that we already knew from the other, what we call in proxy. Basically, it, it, it was like, again, like we took all the cells, digested them, analyzed them, and tried to reconstitute. We want to prove that that technology is actually accurate. And mm -hmm. this one, it proved it because you can see the tumor cell, you can literally see the tumor and the immune system around it. Uh -huh. It's very uncanny. You can really p t take a p pencil and draw a line wow. between the immune cells and the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the immune system was attacking the cell, they'll be overlapping. They'll be already infiltrating, what right. we say. So there'll be a mix of cells and immune cells with each other, next to each other. We didn't see that. We saw the cancer cell is here, the immune is around it, mm -hmm. but it's not attacking. So because of that, then we can show Right now, there are companies that have those drugs that can unleash the immune system mm -hmm. and can work against those fibroblasts to take off the scar tissue, that can work against, like there is agents that can break down blood vessels and prevent the formation of new blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So those agents are available. So now because we're showing them what's available, now they believe that yes, we agree with you, those drugs might be useful mm -hmm. in targeting global breast cancer. And it's going to make it a lot easier to convince them to support our studies going exactly, forward. Exactly. Um, so what were the uh, results of this approach that you presented in the study? Um, how effective was it? Yeah, so uh, we didn't use any medication in that study. It was just to proof of concept. Now, once we start the studies, it'll be interesting to, after we expose those tumors to those drugs, to repeat the same technology. And that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, what, what I'm hoping to see is that the immune cells have infiltrated the cancer and started uh, killing the, those cancer cells and seeing those cancer cells disappearing. Mm -hmm. So this technology, again, is not only look at the immune uh, cells, but it also look at the cancer cells themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it really tells me about the cancer cells and how active they are. So, so, so then after we start those studies, we're planning to repeat this uh, technique after a few weeks of the therapy to mm -hmm. see if the, immune, if the response that we're expecting to see is actually happening. Right, right. Um, so would you like to tell us more about these uh, next steps and uh, how further evaluation of the tumor microenvironment will lead to development of personalized therapeutic approaches? Yes, yeah. yeah, so, this, so this technology is really going to help us develop this first chemo-free regimen that can, again, if you take the immune-enriched plus the highly vascularized at 80% of lobular breast cancer, so the majority, so the, the next step is we're, we're trying to start this uh, study at our institution, hopefully open other institutions, where we're going to mix an immunotherapy plus an anti-angiogenesis agent. So these are anti-blood vessel forming agents. Doesn't contain any chemotherapy. These are targeted therapies. And uh, for patients who become, because lobular breast cancer initially respond to endocrine therapy, eventually it stops responding to. So these are for those patients when the cancer stopped responding to hormonal agents, and at that time they really depended on the immune system to come and join the fight. Right. So we're trying to open for that setting. Amazing. Um, anything else you'd like to mention about, um, about this investigation or your study? So uh, uh, we have multiple different uh, buy-ins from different pharmaceutical companies. At this point, it's very important to choose the right drug mm -hmm. because your drug can make it or break it, as we say. So it's very important when you design those studies, is to choose the right partner. And that's what we're doing right now. And, but we're expecting to move very quickly now that we have those uh, results, those data. We are right now in the process of writing the manuscript using this data that we presented today in our abstract and the one we presented in previous meeting, uh, like the San Antonio and last year's ASCO, mm -hmm. to have this big manuscript that will serve as a blueprint for the study that we're going to uh, be opening soon, hopefully. Amazing. Looking forward to hearing more about it as everything unfolds. Um, so as we wrap up, um, we're going to be doing another video um, after getting back from ASCO about the best of breast cancer research presented here. Um, are there any studies that you've seen so far that you're looking forward to talking more about that uh, listeners should tune in to hear? Yeah, th those meetings are always very exciting uh -huh. <laughs> for me personally and for a lot of other uh, oncologists, I'm sure, um, because that's where we present those uh, exciting data that are a lot of time practice changing that we can implement right when we go back uh, to our daily clinics. 
and seeing our patients. So yes, the, 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 there is multiple exciting stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we can have the chance to go over them. Uh, and they are both, some of them are in the early setting, early breast cancer setting, some of them are the metastatic setting, some of them are definitely practice changing, and some of them are hypothesis generating, meaning they can help us do better treatments for the future. Uh, but definitely there was a lot of practice changing uh, presentation at this uh, ASCO 2024. Uh, be on the lookout, I'm very excited. We'll have a very nice presentation with some slides this time, hopefully, uh, so, so we can go over the data. Awesome, I'm looking forward to it. Well, thanks so much for stopping by today. It was wonderful to uh, hear more about your poster and uh, congratulations on, the, on this work. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Thank you so much, it's my pleasure.